Hey, all of you, and welcome to 2021. Believe it or not, we actually made it through all of 2020, and now we can all pretend that things are going to somehow start getting better just because we're changing one digit in our calendar years. Or at least we can hope, right? So welcome to the first OIC Sunday Reflection of 2021, and welcome to the fifth Sunday of Advent. My name is... Michael, and I'm the pastor at Oslo International Church, and today I want to continue with you in our Advent series, because Advent isn't over. Advent isn't over because neither the waiting is over, nor the conditions into which Christmas happened are over. So no, I haven't really lost the count somehow, or not realized that tradition and the liturgical calendar count four Sundays before Christmas as Advent. Uh, I haven't really forgot that, but Advent continues, and that's not really a new idea. Uh, The word Advent comes from Latin, and that means coming or arrival. And, And throughout the history of the church, it has carried the multiple meanings of marking both the preparations for the celebration of the birth of Christ of Christmas, and marking the expectation for the return of Christ in his second coming. The waiting is not over. Not only the waiting, though, also the conditions into which Christmas happened, the conditions into which incarnation happens, are not over with the birth of Christ, nor are they over today. Christmas is a high point and celebration at the end of our calendar year, but in the gospel stories, it is just the beginning. And the gospel writers have different ways of making sure that we don't somehow detach Christmas from the story that follows and that in many ways follows to this very day. Advent isn't over because While we pack our Christmas decorations into boxes to put in storage, Joseph and Mary pack whatever little belongings they have and can carry, and they grab their baby Jesus, and they flee for his life. It is St. Matthew who tells the story, and he imbues it with a sense of urgency. An angel appears to Joseph in a dream and tells him, Get up, take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. For Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. Joseph gets up, takes Mary and the child and leaves during the night. They leave for Egypt and they leave none too soon because Herod, a political ruler, is furious and orders the death of all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who are two years old and under because he's heard this rumor of the newborn king of the Jews. This is a story filled with pain and fear. And yet it is deeply connected to the story of Christmas. In fact, it is also the story of Christmas. Matthew tells it in the same narrative as he tells us of the Magi from the East. The Magi whom we happily place in our nativity scenes and sing about on Christmas time. The command to flee is given by an angel, much in the same way as the birth of Jesus had been announced to Joseph to be the birth of the Son of God, just on the chapter before in the Gospel of Matthew. But it feels somehow anticlimactic. Back then, in the first chapter, the angel had told Joseph to not be afraid. Do not be afraid, Joseph, to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. But now this angel is telling Joseph, flee, flee. And Joseph is very much afraid as he tries to save the life of this 
little Savior in Mary's arms. Even after Herod is dead and the, fine, and the family finally can return to Israel, Joseph is still afraid and doesn't want to establish himself in Judea, Matthew tells us, because that's where Herod's son Archelaus is reigning. So in another dream warns him and he goes to Galilee, to some remote corner of the country to try and be safe. Fear for one's life, lack of fundamental human rights, oppression by violent rulers, the need to flee one's home after basic conditions of survival for the children. All of these things and more are the conditions into which Christmas happens, into which incarnation happens. And they are not over. Advent isn't over because while we pack our Christmas decorations into boxes to put in storage, many people all over the world today pack whatever belongings they can carry and flee for their lives. Flee from war, from poverty and famine, from domestic violence and from state violence from lack of fundamental human rights and in search of basic conditions of survival for the children. It isn't over. Many Christmases have come and gone, and it isn't over. But I am not calling our attention to all of this as, as some sort of guilt trap. That's not what this is about. This isn't about the hypocrisy of Christmas celebrations. Though it could be. This is about the profound beauty of Christmas. The profound beauty of incarnation. Many years ago, I went on a trip with one of my brothers. We went to, we went to the Amazon rainforest in the north of Brazil to work as volunteers in a relief project. There had been a severe drought on that year, and, and the drought cut off access for many villages, and it affected agriculture, the supply of fish, and it affected the quality of water, which was leading to all sorts of diseases. So we were part of a, of a team dealing with the, the aftermath of the drought. Uh, the team would boat up the river to different riverside communities where they would distribute food packs and water filters and hear how they could help the local leaders. And we went there to be a part of this team and to help as much as we could. But we weren't quite ready for the contrasts that we would have to deal with. While the people that we were there to help were living in very simple conditions and coming out of a very tough period of drought, we had a quite comfortable boat with showers and full-sized bunk beds and a very well-stacked uh, kitchen where we ate very well. And it makes sense, of course. I think it makes sense to keep your staff comfortable and rested and, and well-fed and prepared so that they can give their best on the job. But when we were not on the boat and we were back in town, we were placed in a hotel in a touristy area of the town. And it wasn't a fancy hotel or anything. It was more like a backpacker's hotel. But still, we were supposed to eat at restaurants and, and sleep in a hotel while the people we had come to help were still recovering from food shortage and lack of basic conditions. So my brother and I would go to a local supermarket and buy food and eat it in our hotel room and just trying to some sort of attempt to cut costs and, and really to just an attempt to try to counter that sense of discrepancy between our life and the life of the people we were there to help. We couldn't quite get rid of that feeling though and we had to navigate that feeling along the river and i remember one evening in particular we were up the river somewhere in the middle of the jungle anchored by a village where we had just spent the day with the people there and we had just swum in the river and we were watching the sun set over the canopies of the trees and the water and it was breathtakingly beautiful. And as I looked at 
all the colors of the setting sun dancing on the surface of the river. A young girl, probably eight or nine years old, rode past on the river. She was kneeling in, in the very back of this long wooden canoe, rowing slowly and singing to herself. The contrast between my life and, and the life of the people I had just spent the day with was still churning in my soul. And I felt almost guilty for witnessing such beauty. It was reflecting on that day that I wrote in my notebook the words that you saw on your screen at the beginning of this video. But to deny the beauty of the sun because of my shade would be of all things I've done the, mo the most unholy. I thought about those words again and I found myself thinking about that sunset over the forest, the river, and the singing little girl. As I reflected on how the Christmas stories display the contrasts in such gripping ways. I have my ramblings of poetry about that experience. St. Luke shares with us how Mary processes her experience poetically. And, and what comes out of her mouth is a profound song that could be sung by that girl in the canoe or again by Mary herself on her way to Egypt. And Mary sings, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arms. He has scattered those who are proud in their innermost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. Mary has long been for me a teacher of faith. In this song, what is striking for me is her ability to not get lost in her own experience as wonderful and unique as it is. She, she sees how God acts towards her as a sign of God's redeeming action for all people. And by doing that, she doesn't make her experience less unique and personal. In a sense, she makes it more real. She starts by rejoicing that God sees her that God is mindful of her, and because God sees her and shows her mercy, she is blessed. But she goes from the single to the plural, in the same breath of worship and rejoicing. This God who sees her and is mindful of her sees all those who fear him from generation to generation and acts in mighty deeds of redemption. These mighty deeds, they are marked by acting against the powerful and oppressive and for the weak and trodden. And they are marked by his faithfulness. The word that connects this personal and this collective experience of God's redemptive action in the song of Mary is the word humble. 
humble. He has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. He has lifted up the humble. That which Mary sings about in the gospel, according to St. Luke, Mary and Joseph experience in the gospel, according to St. Matthew, in their flight to Egypt. God is mindful of them. And by warning of the angel, they are saved. And the rich and powerful, Herod and Archelaus, are left frustrated and empty-handed. And the faithfulness of God is displayed all the more in Matthew's telling in that this trajectory of Mary and Joseph to Egypt and back is in fulfillment of prophecies. God has always been mindful, Matthew is telling us. And he has more than Mary and Joseph in the sight of his mindfulness and of his love. But as I looked at these two stories, these two two texts, the song of Mary and her flight to Egypt, and I contemplated these parallels between the song of Mary and this experience of Mary and Joseph as refugees in Egypt, I found myself asking, but how has God lifted the humble? How has God lifted the humble? He has been mindful of them and provided their escape, But they are still somehow oppressed people hiding in a corner of the land to avoid the violence of the powers that be. And they can still hear the cries in Ramah of Rachel weeping for her children, all those others who had died. Where is that connection that goes beyond their personal, localized experience and tells of God being mindful to all who fear Him. And I realized it was no longer a spoken word. The word humble that was an adjective a descriptive of herself and the people of God in the song of Mary was an action on the part of God, an act of incarnation. It was no longer a spoken word. It was the baby in their arms. It was Emmanuel, God with us. It was and it is Jesus himself. The Gospels are the story of the humble being lifted by God humbling himself to be by their side. If the angel telling Joseph to not be afraid and then telling him to flee for his life seems like a paradox, That is good news for us. If the God incarnate, the King of the Jews for whom stars moved, is in the very next breath displayed as a refugee baby, that paradox is good news for us. Because we experience Christ in that paradox. We experience Christ amid the cries of dying children and the joy of newborn babies. Amid violence to our bodies and unspoken hope and peace within our souls. Amid our wealth that is a blessing and yet is somehow entangled in an unfair world that sees some live well while others starve and struggle. We are not given to escape the paradoxes of this existence of ours. But we are given a story, a story that dares speak grace into these paradoxes, into this reality of the life we experience and give us reasons to laugh and cry around the same table of humbling sacrifice and nourishing forgiveness. We are given a word. Not only spoken, but incarnate 
and present. And sure, we can make Christmas into an end in itself. We can make it into a holiday of indulgence and self-serving for festivities where we just try to decorate our houses and our existence in an attempt to sort of rip it apart from the underlying suffering and pain. Or we can have it be about Christ. We can celebrate the beauty of creation and incarnation the beauty of grace and forgiveness, of kindness and merrymaking and fellowship with shared meals. And we can know that this beauty is there for all, for the weak and the humble, for the oppressed and the struggling, for those in pain and those in sorrow, and also for those that rejoice. To deny the beauty of the sun coming in flesh, because we don't quite understand how he shines on all of us, that would be an unholy act. That late afternoon on the river in the Amazon jungle became, became a memory I cherish. And that little girl in the canoe makes sure that I don't desecrate the beauty of that sunset that we shared by forgetting her or by forgetting myself. Her singing voice reminds me that God is with us. Advent isn't over. And that is the memory of Advent. God is with us even as we wait together for all things to be made as beautiful as that moment of grace. God is with us even as we wait and live and act together for all things to be permeated and transformed by the kindness and joy and grace the beauty that we celebrate in Christmas. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and may he give you peace go in peace and serve the lord joyfully